Jesse and Judy were walking home from school and it was just like any other day except for something bad and sinister in the news once again. Once again the news about the Japanese urban legend Tiki Tiki was in the spotlight after some poor girl was found murdered and her body sliced straight off at her waist, leaving her bleed to death while her legs lay on the train tracks. The legend began in Japan years and years ago. Nobody knows the exact year, but every so often these horrific murders happen. The Tiki Tiki got its name when a schoolgirl was making her way home from school one day and she was said to have fallen onto the train tracks where her body was cut in half by the train. She is known as an Onryo or a vengeful spirit who lurks in urban areas and around train stations at night. Since the girl has no longer a lower body, she travels on either her hands or elbows, dragging her upper torso and making a scratching sound or a tiki like sound. If the girl comes across an individual, she will chase them and slice them in half at the torso, killing them exactly the way that would mimic her own disfigurement. The girls were chatting about the latest murder. Sarah said, I know that people are talking about this silly legend Tiki Tiki, but no way is it that girl. It's some serial killer that is copycatting the legend. I bet he will get caught, and then people will see it's just some madman or mad woman. Judy said, You don't know. It might be that girl. Actually, I believe it is that girl. It has to be. Why else would it be murders pop up every so often? I think we should walk home together from now on. It's not safe for us to be alone. Walking alone in this creepy train station? No way! The girls waited anxiously at the train station. It was extremely quiet probably due to the fact of the latest news of yet another poor girl having her body cut in two. The train was approaching and the girls would be happy to get into it and get home. Suddenly Sarah discovered her phone was missing. She said, oh no, my phone. She looked around and spotted it over by a bench. The girls got into the train and suddenly Sarah was walking towards the door when the doors shut. She screamed as she had a fear overcome her whole body knowing she'd be all alone in this creepy train station. Suddenly she heard a scratching sound. She put it down to her imagination, hoping it was her imagination, praying it was her imagination. She heard it again. She turned around and she screamed when she saw a girl with no legs crawling along the ground. Suddenly the girl gained speed. Sarah ran and ran, but the girl with no legs used a huge knife to slice Sarah in two. The tiki tiki noise stopped as the girl stopped, smiling down at Sarah, bleeding to death. Hello, this story is about a boy called Jason who one day had an argument about whether real magic does or doesn't exist. Jason told his friend Barry that it was just all tricks but none of it was real magic. But Barry disagreed completely. Jason said, You really expect me to believe that there are magicians that can really disappear and really fly from one city to the next by just flying like Superman? Barry said, I don't know what type of magic magicians can do, but I just know that real magic exists. 
Jason said, okay, so if you're so convinced real magic exists, why don't you just show me a real magician? Anyone. Barry said, actually I do, I can let you meet a real magician, just don't let him know you don't believe in real magic. Don't ask why, just trust me, he doesn't take kindly to skeptics, especially when they're skeptical of him. Two days later they arrived at this fast food restaurant and Barry was introduced to the chef, who was called the Magical Chef by his friend. The Magical Chef said, well, hi there. I don't usually talk about magic to people I don't know, but your friend there, Barry, is a great friend of mine, and any friend of Barry is a friend of mine. Jason smiled and said, Well, I don't really believe in magic, but... Barry coughed, as if to remind Jason not to let the magical chef know Jason doesn't believe in real magic. The chef said, I'll get your usual Barry, and I'll get your friend my speciality Four Seasons Pizza. The chef was making the pizza, with his blood boiling, knowing Jason didn't believe in real magic. He told himself he would teach him a lesson that magic was real. When the pizza arrived, Jason ate it like it was the first meal he had in a week. When he walked home that evening alone, it got really sunny like a scorching hot summer's day, which was strange because just minutes ago it was a nice spring day, but kind of cold. It suddenly got very warm, and the sun started shining like a really hot summer's day. Then a few minutes later he was passing, trees and all the leaves were falling off them, with the wind as if it just turned to autumn. Then suddenly it started snowing, like it was the middle of the winter. He was freaked out thinking of the name of the pizza, Four Seasons, and wondered was that the chef's magic? He rang his friend and his friend told him, I'm not going to explain nothing more to you except that the chef is a true magician like I said. Because magic is real, I told you this all along. You just need to believe and I told you if he knows you don't believe his magic is real, if he is in a bad mood he is liable to do anything. I've heard stories. A few days later, Jason went into a restaurant in his town. He got a flyer from a person on the street, with a voucher for a free dessert with the meal. After his meal, he realized the free dessert was a delicious ice cream. He enjoyed every bite of it. The waitress said to Jason, You sure enjoyed that, I can see. Jason froze when he realized it was the magical chef and the dessert was called Death by Chocolate. He wondered did the chef poison the ice cream. Thankfully he felt fine. Jason was walking home when suddenly an ice cream truck ran him over and killed him. Mark was on his way to his psychologist for another appointment. He was tired of people saying he was deluded, not believing him. He saw weird things more and more lately, but what frustrated him so much was no one believing him. He knew what he saw was real. He reached the building and went inside and took the elevator to the third floor where his psychologist had his office. While he was in the elevator, he was thinking of what to tell his psychologist this week. In the office, Mark's psychologist spoke. Oh Mark, don't worry. We are going to get to the bottom of this. We just need to find out a few things about what happened in your past that might be causing these breaks in reality. I am going to show you a few drawings, and I would kindly appreciate if you told me what you saw in them, please. 
Mark's psychologist held up the first photo and Mark looked at it for a few seconds, then said, I see a dragon. Then he held up another. And what do you see in this one please Mark? Mark yet again took another few seconds to look at it and then said, some kind of alien. Mark was getting impatient with this exercise he saw many times in the movies and he often wondered what it was in aid of. It was like it was just trying to find out was the person crazy and he knew he wasn't crazy, he knew he saw what he saw. The only thing is, why doesn't anyone believe him? He felt like if someone just believed him, maybe they would go away. His psychologist held up another photo. Mark took longer this time and then said, it's obviously a gun. His psychologist smiled and said, okay Mark, this is going to take a while to sort out, but I can guarantee you that what you see is not real and that's for sure. 13 minutes later the session had ended and Mark had left the building. His psychologist felt strange. He felt kind of faint. Then he froze in fear when he saw a dragon fly into the room. Then what looked like an alien came into the room. He screamed out in horror, but before his receptionist could come into the room to see what was wrong, a gun floated in the air over to his head, and then the gun went off. When the receptionist came into the room, she screamed and called the police telling them he had shot himself in the head. Mark wondered why his psychologist killed himself, but he was relieved. His visions had stopped. Me and my friend Mike were hanging out during our Christmas holidays. We were playing computer games. We were enjoying being inside in the cosy house as it was cold outside. But we soon got tired of being cocked up inside so went out for a walk up the road from my house. We passed an old house that people said was haunted. My friend asked me, is that really haunted? It looks so cool. I said, I'm not sure is it haunted, but people say it is. My friend said, we should go into that house. It would be so cool. I said, no way, I don't want to go in there. It's really old, even if it's not haunted, it could fall down on top of us. My friend laughed and said, come on, if we don't go into this house, we will be laughing about this in about 20 years time, laughing that you were scared to go in. My friend laughed again. I didn't give in so we just went back home playing more computer games. I didn't see my friend anymore after that as he had moved to the next town and there was no social media back then that people could stay in touch with. 20 years later I was watching a Christmas movie on TV and there was a knock on the door. I got up to answer it. Before I answered I could see a young boy with what looked like a bag walking out on the road. I looked down at my footstep and noticed a paper. I picked it up and read it. The heading read, Young boy's remains found during the demolition of an old house. It continued to explain what I knew was my friend. I wondered how he could have ended up in the house as we didn't go in that day. I went back inside and sat down on my chair. On Christmas morning I was opening my gifts and came across one that had no name on it. When I opened it there was a note inside which read, If you had just gone in that day 20 years ago with me, we would be laughing about it a different way today like I said. But now I'm dead as I went in myself a week later and was killed by a guy dressed as Santa Claus. Suddenly I jumped as my doorbell rang. 
I wondered who it was, still in shock by getting a letter from my friend who was killed by a guy dressed as Santa Claus 20 years ago. I didn't even realize he was killed until now. I just thought I didn't see him since he moved town. The doorbell rang again. I snapped out of my daze and went to answer it. There was a guy dressed as Santa Claus, holding a knife, and he said, Happy Christmas. He stabbed the knife into me as I was lying down on the ground. I knew I was dying. The Santa Claus smiled down at me and said, That story in the paper was a bit fabricated. They picked up on a little white lie. You see, it was me who killed that guy, dressed up as Santa Claus. Yes, you guessed it right. If you guessed, I am your friend. Yes, I was your friend. Until they put me away 20 years ago, and they put me away for 20 years. They said they'd only put me away until I was 18. But this annoying guy got a bad beating in the place they kept me. It's amazing and funny how they picked up on a little white lie 20 years later. But wait, you might ask what are the remains of the person killed there. If it wasn't me, then who is it? Oh, I better fast forward telling this story before you bleed to death before you hear the end. The remains you see were of me. The bastard cut my fingers off and knocked a few of my teeth out in the struggle when I killed him. Wasn't it coincidence they only discovered it 20 years later, exactly from the date we went into that house? Yes, I keep a diary, that's how I know. I gave an anonymous tip because I knew that my mom had told everyone I went missing. They didn't want anyone knowing their precious little son was locked up in an asylum. They just threw me in there and forgot about me. They said I was missing, and that's why the paper assumed it was me that was killed in that house. After all, the media didn't know there was no man killed there that day. They were so good in covering up my disappearance. I would have never been locked up if that Santa Claus didn't attack me 20 years ago. It was self-defense, but they didn't see it that way. He went crazy, shouting. It was his home. He kept saying he wasn't going to get out of there. I didn't care if he wanted to live there or wanted to run out and never see the place again. But he took out a knife and attacked me. Ah, but luckily I learned martial arts and I protected myself. But they treated me like the criminal, not the victim. But now you will be a victim. You are a victim. And soon you will be a dead victim. Two weeks later, I was in a hospital and was shocked I was alive. A man was standing next to me and spoke. Jake, I am your psychologist. I need to tell you something. For years and years I have been your psychologist, and I must say you're my most interesting patient. You suffer from something called a disassociative disorder, and have a split personality. You often spoke about a friend called Mike growing up to your mom and me. But Jake, I can confirm you never had a friend by the name of Mike. Jake, this might be very hard for you to take in. But even though I have told you for years you had no friend called Mike, it was just like you forgot I told you a few minutes later. It was like you buried any memory of me or anyone telling you Mike wasn't real. It was the day you went to the haunted house. I got my first proof, and I'm sorry Jake, but that is what had you committed to an asylum. It wasn't Mike who was in the asylum, Jake. It was you. The hidden cameras around your house 
took footage of you playing a computer game, talking to Mike, who wasn't there. And he was never there, Jake, because Mike didn't exist, except inside your own head. Mike is part of your split personality. That day, I followed you, filming you with my video camera. And Jake, I'm going to show you what I filmed. The man held up his phone and a video played. It was me outside the haunted house. And then I was inside the house, punching into thin air. Then I felt faint when I saw myself cut off my own fingers and pull a few of my teeth out. The man took the phone away and said, Jake, after I showed this to your mom and the authorities, etc., we had no other choice but to have you put away in the asylum. I tried to whisper, and the man didn't hear me, so he came closer. I took out the fork I kept from dinner and stuck it in the man's eye, then said, You should have left me and my friend Mike alone. Joe was walking down the street, and a person bumped into him. He was a bit annoyed, as the person didn't even apologize. When he got home, he saw his wife crying on the phone, saying, Joe was drunk last night, and walked in front of a car, and died. Jeff couldn't speak. He couldn't move or breathe. He regretted not getting cremated when he realized it would be like this inside a coffin. My wife asked me why I was breathing heavily. She realized I wasn't when she saw a man staring at her breathing heavily. I froze watching the girl look in my window, knowing I was on the 20th floor. A policeman tells me on the phone my wife was found murdered in the woods. While I was looking at her grinning at me with leaves stuck in her hair. Don't be afraid of monsters. You won't see them under your bed, in your closet, on your right side, or on your left. Just don't look up. The monster will attack you if it knows you see it clinging to your ceiling. It has been a whole 365 days I had been the last person on earth. There was a knock on the door. I heard the scream across the room, but my eyes can't open and I can't move. I love to sing in the shower. When I got out, I saw written on the mirror, You have such a beautiful voice. Jason watched the children play, oh how high they swung. Then he realized it wasn't a game, but a rope from where they hung. Thank you.
Sarah was really excited to finally get a chance to work at her dream job, which was a model. She got a letter through the mail offering her a photo shoot at a really exclusive model agency. It was really big in the modeling world because no one actually knew who the photographer was or who the models were, but they were featured in big magazines and big art exhibitions. Sarah used to like the gothic style of the models. They were like mannequins, she used to think. Sarah received an email telling her what time the photo shoot was and the directions. She got a taxi to the photo shoot and she was so excited. She said to the taxi driver, I'm really excited because I'm going to do a photo shoot for this really cool modeling photographer. His work is featured in huge magazines and very important art exhibitions. The taxi driver smiled. When Sarah got there, she was surprised when a man wearing a masquerade mask answered the door. She wondered was he the photographer and asked him, Hello sir, are you the photographer? He replied, Yes dear, I am the photographer and you will become a very good model. Just sit in the room there and I will be with you in a few minutes. I'll make you a cup of tea. I just have to get a few last minute details done. Then I will take a very artistic photo shoot of you. The man gave Sarah the cup of tea and asked her to wait a few minutes while he got things ready for the photo shoot. When Sarah was in her room she saw a few photos of a girl sitting down with flowers around her and she thought it looked so beautiful. As she was waiting for the photographer she was looking around the room. There was a curtain and she wondered what was behind it. Her curiosity got the better of her so she went behind behind it. She jumped when she saw the girl in the photo was sitting still on the chair. She guessed it must have been a mannequin, but as she held her hand, she knew by how cold it was and the feel of it that it was a corpse. She jumped when the photographer was behind her. He spoke. Now, now, dear, why were you so intrusive to look behind that curtain? You have stumbled across my secret recipe to success. This is the true way of capturing true beauty. I kill my models just a few minutes before I photograph them, and they don't have violent killings. I just poison them with a cup of tea so I can easily move their facial expression to how I want it. You see, dear, they say a photograph captures a moment, but I capture a moment entirely, that moment of that person's last moment. Yes, I might take away their cup of tea and move them around a little, but still, that pose for that photograph is their last moment. Sarah screamed. The photographer said, Now, now, dear, don't be like that. You are a very good girl to finish your cup of tea, I see. Sarah felt faint, and the man posed her in the chair for her photo shoot.